minds are filled with all kinds of knowledge. But exactly how certain is that knowledge, and how useful is it? Right now, there's not much you need to know. You're sitting here focusing on your breath. Notice how the breath feels. And if it doesn't feel comfortable, see what you can do to make it more comfortable. So notice what you're doing and notice the results you're getting from what you're doing. That's a very direct kind of knowledge. The sensation of ease or stress or whatever you're feeling with a breath. That's something you experience directly. It was the kind of thing you experienced back when you were a child, before you knew language at all. You were experiencing these things. And it's a very direct kind of knowledge. As you move away from this, things get less and less certain. And in order to function in life, we have to deal with certain uncertainties. But for the time being, let's stick with what's really certain, just what you're doing with the breath and the results you're getting. Notice when you're putting too much pressure on it, or too, not enough pressure. Not enough means that you, the mind just starts floating away. Because as you do this, you're learning a very important principle, the principle of action. This, for the Buddha, is a basic truth, cause and effect, the action should you do and the results you get. When he described his awakening in its simplest terms, it was a principle of causality, which applied directly to this issue. What are you doing? What results are you getting in particular? What are you doing that's causing suffering? And what can you do to put an end to suffering? Those are his basic building blocks. And as for other issues that come up in the practice, they should all be related back to those building blocks. Like the whole question of self. We're often taught that the Buddha taught that there wasn't a self, and then immediately the question is, well, who's doing the actions? Who's receiving the results, what goes from one life to the next. But that's putting the cart before the horse, assuming that this teaching on not-self, which is an interpretation, is the primary teaching. We forget the primary teaching is the fact of action and result, skillful and unskillful. If you take that as your context, then the issue of self becomes a question of what kind of activity is self, and what are the results? When you look at your sense of self in that way, then you begin to realize it's, it's something you do, it's something you put together, given circumstances. You perceive a certain world out there. Again, that's an assumption based on some things you've done. And then you assume a self acting in that world. This is not just metaphysical. As we know it today, it's often psychological. You sense certain motives that other people have, and you react to those assumptions. And what happens? You often suffer. If it's the four-year-old you, you suffer a lot. So we've got to remember that we have to be able to take those worlds apart, take that sense of self apart, see them both as actions. You create your sense of that particular world. You're reading the data and you're reading certain things into it. And you're coming out with suffering. So what you'll learn how to do is to read the data in a different way that's not going to lead to suffering. This is one of the reasons why the breath is so useful, because you can step outside of a lot of those worlds. You've got the world of the breath here. You can always tap into that, because it's always here as long as you're alive. And from this perspective, you can look at action and its results in a very direct way, because your intentions are right there next to the breath. 
There's nothing in the body, there's nothing in the physical world that's any closer to your mind than your breath. And you keep looking away, 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 making assumptions about the world outside and neglecting some very important data that's right here. You probably heard those reports they've had of discovering planets around other stars beside the sun. Well, nobody so far has actually seen any of the planets. They have certain data that indicate fluctuations in the star's brightness that would suggest that there's a planet there. You know, it's what do they really know in those experiments? Well, they know what they did, and they know the data they got. That's what they know. And the assumption of the planet is just an assumption. May turn out right, may turn out wrong. But notice how they do that. The, the actual knowledge there is the knowledge of how they ran the experiment and what kind of data they got. The direct data, the numbers that come out. And as you're a meditator, you want to keep your focus that clear, that close. What are you doing with the breath? What are you doing with the mind? And what results do you get? And sometimes you find you create a sense of self around the breath. As you get more and more used to the breath energy in the body, you'll find that you have a set series of ways of identifying yourself as the breather, which will create certain patterns of tension in the body that are really, really tenacious. Some patterns of tension come and go with each breath. Others last a little bit longer, but the, the ones associated with the breather, those tend to last. Which is why it's good to loosen up your conception of what it means to breathe, where the breath is coming in, what needs to be done for it to go out. You can think of the body as a large sponge. The breath can come in from all directions. You don't have to pull it in through the nose. And breath energy is not something you, that you have to fight to pull in. It just comes in, goes out. It's all ready to come in if you just let it. Think of it that way, and you find yourself breathing in a different way. It shows you the power of your thought, the power of your assumptions, what they call attention, or manasikara, in the texts. So again, the knowledge there is knowledge of what you're doing and the results you get. That's, that's the basic data. That's where your knowledge is clearest, when you move out from that and make assumptions. You get more and more into the world of uncertainty. And as I said earlier, it's good to have certain assumptions to function, like a table. You know that if you walk, try to walk through the table, you can't walk through it. You bang your shins. And so you learn, makes, learn to make some assumptions about the solidity of the table. But exactly how solid is that table? We think of solid mass as being that totally solid, totally filled, but it's not. You've probably read about all the atoms in the table and how each atom has a lot more space than it actually has any hard matter. And of course, then there's the question of, does it really have any hard matter? Is it just electrical vibrations, magnetic vibrations, whatever vibrations? And you say, well, as far as I'm concerned, all I need to know is that if I try to walk through the space between the atoms, I can't do it. Keep bumping up against that sense of solidity. So which of these assumptions is true? They're all true. The question is which one is useful. If you're trying to walk across the room and you want to walk through the table, remember the solidity of the table so you don't bang your shins. Now, if you want to develop psychic powers and walk through tables, that's another matter. But the important thing here is you realize all your knowledge of the world is from your actions and the results you get from those actions. That's the basic data. And for the Buddha, that's the basic data, too. It's just that he keeps reminding you, 
keep looking back at your actions and don't get too sucked into your assumptions, to the worlds that you create out of these things, or to the different senses of self that you create around these things. Learn to look for the ones that are useful, the assumptions that are useful, but also learn how to take them apart to remind yourself they are just that, assumptions. So when they start causing harm, they start, start to cause suffering, you can drop them. Realize that that's not the right time, that's not, not the right place for these things. The Buddha's assumptions about what's useful to know and what's not useful to know parallel very closely his ideas about what's useful to speak about or what, what's right to speak about. He says you speak about things that are true, but just because they're true doesn't mean you have to speak about them. You have you also have to look for when they're useful. And even that's not enough. You have to look at what's the right time and the right place to speak about these things. Well, the same thing applies to truths. There are lots of truths about the world out there. It's just like there are lots of radio waves going through the air right now. Which one? Which truths are useful to tune into right now? You have the usefulness and the sense of time and place. This is why the Buddha avoided questions about is there a self or is there no self or is the world eternal or is the world not eternal? Because he realized these things are constructions. There are actually times when a sense of self is useful, when you want to be responsible, when you want to learn how to delay your desire for immediate gratification, for long-term gratification. Those are times when you really need to have a clear sense of self. But there are other times when a sense of self actually gets in the way. So you look at it as an activity, something you do. And then you can stop doing it when it's not useful. The same about, about your different perceptions of the world, the physical world, the psychological world, whatever the worlds you're involved with. Tune in to the frequency that's helpful right now. And let the other ones go. So this is why we focus on the breath, because the breath is an area where you can establish awareness. So you can begin to see these activities. How does the mind create a sense of self? How does it create a sense of world? What are the actual data that it's got right here? What are the assumptions that it builds out of? When you're with the breath, you can see this a lot more easily, because the breath is one of the building blocks from which these things are created. The way you manipulate the energy in your body is going to determine how you identify yourself, what sense of the world you have. If the energy in your body is really uncomfortable, whatever world you've got out there is going to feel really confining. But if you can breathe through it, you can learn to walk through those uncomfortable worlds, dissolve them away. This doesn't mean that you can create anything that you like out of anything. In other words, there, there are some limits on the realities that you can create based on the results of your past actions. But when you stick with this level of just what are you doing and what are the results? That's when you stay closest to the truth. You see what the possibilities are. What, at the present moment, is the most skillful way to interpret your experience of reality? What can you shape? What can you not shape? And when you keep it on this level, you find you can deal with reality, shape your reality in a lot more skillful way.